All right, my message title today is Two Roads, Two Destinies. Everybody on the planet is walking on two roads, a broad road and a narrow road. And that broad road leads to death and destruction, eternal separation from God. And the narrow road is where the Christians are walking on. And it's a narrow road that leads to eternal life in the kingdom of heaven. So this is a topical sermon about heaven and hell. It's going to get serious. It's going to get deep. But before we do that, let's start with something funny, shall we? So there's a story of these hundred people that die. hundred men die and they go to heaven. So St. Peter meets them at the gate and he shows them these two big signs in heaven. The one sign says, men who did what their wives told them to do. You know who you are. The other sign said, men who did what they wanted to do. So St. Peter says, okay, guys, get into your different lanes. And 99 men go to this side where the sign says, do uh, men who do what their wives told them to do. Only one man steps on the other side. St. Peter is angry at the men and he says, I'm ashamed of you men. You let your wife wear the pants in the house and be the boss of the relationship. Only one man here yeah, stands independent and steadfast. And he looks at the man and says, young man, tell me, how did you do it? He says, I don't know. My wife told me to stand here. <laughs> it seems like men will never, ever win, even in heaven. <laughs> so basically, the, the message is about heaven and hell. It's going to be serious. It's going to be deep. So now and again, I just want to make it a little bit lighter because I don't want you to walk out there completely discouraged and depressed, but walk up here at least with a little bit of a smile on your face, about that big. All right, the message comes from the book of Matthew. So if we have your Bibles, we can open to the book of Matthew, chapter 7. We read in just two verses. Two verses from Matthew, chapter 7. It says, They enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow is the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. This passage actually comes from the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Who's heard of that before, the Sermon on the Mount? Yeah, it's basically the Gospel of Matthew is about Jesus Christ. The first four chapters is about his birth and his baptism and his temptation. And then five, six, and seven, three chapters are dedicated to one sermon that Jesus gives. And here he's talking about adultery and divorce, judging others, a whole lot of things he talks about. At the end of the sermon, he mentions this phrase. And he says simply that broad is the road, and the least in destruction, and many are entering into it. And there's another road, a narrow road, and only few enter into that one. So what I want to do first is just talk about two things, the two roads and the two destinies. So let's talk about the two roads. The first one is the broad road, the broad road that leads to destruction. And this is spiritual for eternal separation from God. And most of us would think, well, why is it such a broad road? Why does it have to be so big? Because the only people on that road are the evil, wicked people. You know, the, the serial murderers and the rapists. No, that's not true. It's broad and wide because bulk of the people on that road think they're on the right road, but they're actually on the wrong road. Let me read you what Proverbs says. Proverbs says this, There is a way or a road that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. You see, there is a lane on this broad road where the wicked people are, the real evil people, and they know where they're going. They know that they're going to be separated from God. They know that they're doing wrong, and they know that the end is death and destruction. But a lot of the other lanes are people just like you and me, people who are good, sincere, loving people, but still on the wrong road. There's one of these lanes called the unbelief lane, the unbelief lane. And this is for people that have been exposed to Christianity, know about Jesus, know about God, but chosen to reject him. And in South Africa and like America, Australia, those countries, we are privileged to live in a country where we've been brought up with that understanding. If you're brought up in the Middle East, you hardly ever hear about Christianity. So in South Africa, even if you're not a Christian or from a Christian family, you would be exposed to Christianity. At some point in your life, you would have heard that Jesus Christ is God and he's the God of Christ the Christians. And then you have a choice to accept that or reject that. So there is a lane called the unbelief lane, and these are people that have rejected Jesus. But they're not wicked people. They're not evil people. They're generally good people. They just don't believe in Jesus. There's another lane on that broad road, and that is the moral lane. These are people that live good lives. They're good, loving, sincere people, and they help others. They're really the top-notch citizens of the community, but they don't believe in Jesus. They believe that through their good works, they'll be saved. So they think they're on the right road, 
And by their works, one day they'll appear before God and God will say, okay, you can enter into heaven because of your good works. The Bible says we're saved by God's grace. That not of works, that not of yourselves. So no matter how good you think you are, those good works still won't get you into heaven. And this is a class of people that, that find it very difficult to become Christians. Good people. Because if you're good and you think you're good, then why do you need someone to save you from your sins if you don't think you have any sins? It's the criminals in the prisons. They become Christians far quicker than good people because they see the depths of their sin and they see their sin and their need for a savior. I always say that bad people become Christians quicker than good people because they know that they're sinners and they need a savior. But good people, no. They squeaky clean. They do very good stuff. They help everybody. It's the kind of people we don't like. You know, there's people that are just so good, they get obnoxious. Those kind of people, those people, they have their own lane. They think by their good deeds, they will enter into heaven. And then you get another one called the religious lane. Ah, this is a step up from the moral lane. They're very good, sincere people, loving people. They have beautiful, mild-mannered kids. You, these kids of the most beautiful kids ever, not like your kids. Your kids are rotten and spoiled to the core. You know, really, really good people. And they are good because their religion dictates that they should be good. Like the Muslims, for example. The Muslims believe that through their works, they all get into paradise, their heaven. They believe in the five pillars of faith. If you're around Muslims or know about Islam, they believe in the professional faith, which is they believe that Allah is their God and Muhammad is the prophet. They believe in the five prayers a day. You have to have five prayers a day. You have to fast during the uh, month of Ramadan, the Christmas. I hate using that term. Because Christmas is when Jesus Christ was born, and that's our day. It should never be mixed with Allah. But anyway, they call it their Christmas. And then they got to go on a pilgrimage to Mecca. So they have these five things that they have to do. And only if they do that, they will enter into the kingdom of heaven one day, and Allah will accept them. Same as the, the Buddhists, they have eight things to do, even more than the, the Muslims. They have what they call the eightfold path. And they call it good intentions, um, good speech, good actions, good lifestyle, all things like that. And only if they do those eight things will they one day enter into paradise. The Hindus, if you know about Hinduism, they believe in reincarnation. Have you heard of that before? Reincarnation is when you die and your soul goes and comes back into another body. And then when you die, your soul goes and comes back into another body over and over until you become a really, really good person. So you can start like really, really bad, then you move your way up to a normal person, and then eventually after thousands of reincarnations, you will eventually end up as a priest. And that's kind of the highest level. After that, you become a god. Yay, chop for you. All right. That's what they believe. But it's based on their works. The harder you work, the better chance you have of being reincarnated into a higher form. So you might actually start out like an ant or a mosquito, and then you promote to a rat, and then maybe a dog, and then, oh, one day you become a person. Well done. <laughs> You're on your way now. All based on works. Religion will not lead you to heaven. In fact, religion leads you straight to the pit of hell. Because religion is based on your own deeds, on your own works. Christianity stands apart from all other religions. Because Christianity dictates that we are saved by God's grace. Even the Roman Catholics, they believe in God's grace, but they add on the seven sacraments. And that's a bit dodgy, because you either believe in Jesus or you don't. You can't have good of both worlds. Catholicism, along with many other Christian cults and the religions, all have a system of works to be saved. And that is not what God dictates. So on this broad road, we have many lanes. And there's only a small lane with the wicked people, the evil people, the people that should be there. And then you get all these other people, good, sincere people, people in your families, people in your workplaces, people in your schools. that are good people, sincere people. They help people. They don't believe in Jesus Christ, they're on the wrong road. There's another road Jesus talks about, the narrow road. And it's a very small road, and only Christians are on that road. And that road leads to eternal life. All of us were on the broad road. When we were born, we were born sinners. So when you were born as a little baby taking your first steps, you were walking on that broad road. And then as you grew up, became an adult or a teenager, you realize that Christianity is true and right, and the Bible is true and correct, and Jesus Christ is God, and he died for our sins. And somewhere along that broad road, you made a decision to turn around. You became a Christian, that moment of conversion, whenever it might have been in your life. And then you made a U-turn, and from the broad road, you stepped into what I call the Jesus road, or the Jesus way. Why do I call it the Jesus way? Because Jesus said, I am the way, 
the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. You know, there's a new religion out there called the Baha'i Faith. B-A-H-A-I. And they've really capitalized on religions. So they, they've done something that they, people should have thought about years ago. You know what they've done? They decided to start a religion that incorporates all religions. Isn't that such a cool idea? We never thought about that before, did we? <laughs> religions for thousands of years have been fighting with each other. You believe this and Hindus and Islam and Christians. They just decided, listen, let's just start a religion where everybody can worship the one God. So you know what their temple looks like? It's a round temple with nine doors representing the nine religions. And whatever religion you are, you go through that door and you come to the front where everybody worships God. Can I just say it like very plainly that the God of the Quran is not the God of the Bible. All right? There is not one God for all religions. There are very, very different gods indeed. The God of Christianity is the true God. All other gods are false gods. There's only one narrow road. And Jesus says, if you're on that road, you're going to be leading to eternal life in the kingdom of heaven. So let's look at the two destinies. The two destinies is simply, who can name the first one? Las Vegas. What's the second one? No, it's heaven and hell. All right? There's only two destinies, heaven and hell. Heaven is this amazing place that all Christians hope to get there one day. We all think, oh, it's going to be so awesome. And I think Christians really don't understand the reality of heaven. Sometimes we still think it's on the clouds somewhere. We'll be playing the harp or the guitar, the baby little cupid angels around us. That's not heaven. Heaven is very, very real. You know that heaven is mentioned over 700 times in the Bible. 700 times. It's pretty important. Who knows what the, the first time heaven is mentioned in the Bible? Genesis 1 verse 1. So let me see how clever you guys are. I'll give you 20 bucks if you can complete this verse. I'll give you 20 bucks from Baden's wallet. All right, Baden, hold your wallet out. This is coming from you. All right, I'm going to say part of the verse. You complete it for me. In the beginning, God. Baden, take out your wallet. A lot of people got that right. All right, so you owe a lot of people 20 bucks. Yeah, all right. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. If you're from the King James old school like me, that would have been the verse. In the beginning, God created the heaven. And the earth. But if you, from the new versions and new translations, you'd have picked up that heavens is now plural. Did you pick that up? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, which is correct. There's more than one heaven. There's three heavens. The first heaven is the atmospheric heavens, where the clouds are, where the birds are. Genesis 1.16 talks about the birds in the heaven. So that's heaven number one. Heaven number two is the starry heavens, where the planets are, celestial bodies, where the planets are. In Genesis 15, God is talking to Abraham and he says, look up at the stars in the heaven. And if you can count them, that's how many descendants you will have. That's the second heaven, the starry space. And the third heaven is the heaven of heavens. This is where God dwells. This is where he lives and this is where we will go to when we die. As Christians, believing in Jesus, when we die from this earth, uh, Philippians says that to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. So we believe that when we die here, we will open our eyes and we will be instantaneously in the presence of Almighty God in the heaven of heavens. Heaven of heavens. That's where we will go when we die and pass on from this world. And heaven is just this amazing place. It's got things very much like we do. Even if I can tap this thing, I know that this is real, this is wood, this is plastic. I don't know if there's plastic in heaven. I think God forbid that long time ago. But if you look around, yes, wood, this is all very real. You know that Heaven is real too. Heaven talks about walls and gates and windows. It talks about mountains. It talks about rivers. And it talks about trees and plants and fruit. All very real things that we have on this earth. In the book of Revelation, John sees a, a city coming down from heaven. And it's a big, beautiful city the size of a continent. And he mentions all very real things. Like the things I mentioned. Even food. You know that it's going to be food in heaven. Somebody asked me, what food? I don't know what food is going to be in heaven because the first thing that people want is hamburgers. I can ask God, but I don't know if there's hamburgers in heaven. All right? Somebody says it's going to be manna. I don't want manna for the rest of my life neither. I don't know what food, but when we die, well, in, the, in the rapture or even when we die, we're going to sit at the marriage supper of the Lamb in heaven. And, and that's a supper. So I, I, I assume that there's going to be food on that table one day. Um, even animals, you know, and I can't promise you that cuddles your cat is going to be in heaven. I don't know. I don't want to go there, all right? But I can promise you that there's animals in heaven. Elijah was caught up in a chariot and a horse. Elisha saw on the mountains angels and horses. Even Jesus himself, when he returns, he'll be on a, 
a horse, a white horse. So we know without a doubt there's horses in heaven. If there's horses, why can't there be other animals? All right. So there's very real things in heaven, as real as earth is, just without sin, without the devil, and like a billion or trillion times better than earth. But still very, very real. As much as heaven is real, so is hell. And people have these wrong, crazy ideas about hell. All right, I heard this funny story about this man who dies and he goes to hell. And there he's with the devil and the devil's showing him around. And he says, in, in hell, every country has a hell. So he says, there's American hell, there's the Russian hell, there's the Canadian hell. So the man says to him, oh, that's interesting. Um, well, what do they do in the American hell? He says, well, first they put you in an electric chair. And then after that, on a bed of nails. And then after that, the American devil whips you for eternity. So he says, oh, and that one over there, he says, that's the Russian hell. He says, what do they do there? He says, well, they put you in an electric chair and then on a bed of nails. And then the Russian devil gets you and whips you for all eternity. And then he looks around and he sees another hell. And there's like thousands of people wanting to get into this hell. Like they're, they're, they're fighting each other, wanting to get into this hell. And he, he looks at the devil and says, well, what hell is that? And the guy says, well, that's a South African hell. And he says, I don't understand. Why does everyone get in here? What, what's different about that one? And he says, well, they have an electric chair, they have a bed of nails, and they have the South African devil that hits you for all eternity. The man says, well, I don't understand. It's the same as the other hells. He says, no, well, this is the thing. Because of load shedding, the electric chair never works. Because of the high crime, the nails have been stolen. And the South African devil works for the government and is never there when you need him. <laughs> So some people have these crazy ideas about hell. One of the, the myths that I've always uh, frowned upon is the fact that the devil is on a throne in hell and he's ruling over these subjects. And, and that's not true. That's a fairy tale. It's not biblical. The Bible says that the devil is walking around like a roaring lion waiting to see who he can devour. One day the devil will be thrown into the lake of fire along with everybody else. He'll become one of its occupants. He will definitely not rule it. So that's the first thing we must get of idea that the, the devil has some sort of a kingdom where he's on a throne. He doesn't. He's just an angel, a fallen one, and his day will come. The Bible explains hell pretty, pretty clearly. Jesus in the Gospels talked about hell numerous times. And if I can summarize what he said, it's simply this. Hell is a place of torment and agony in unquenchable fire forever and ever. That's hell. Has anybody ever burnt themselves before? Even on a stove or a kettle or in a fire? Me, you can see I'm English, I can't bry. So every time I have a bry, I burn something off my body. My eyelashes, my hair. <laughs> so we've all had this experience of sometimes of being burnt. Even if it's just momentarily, like just touching the kettle or something like that. Now imagine that feeling over your whole body forever and ever. Does that change it a little bit for you? Because that's what hell is. Hell is not a party. Hell is not this place where we're just going to be doing stuff for the devil. Hell is a place where you're going to be surrounded with fire, tormented in agony for eternity. And you know what the sobering thought about this is? We have people that we know that right now today is heading there. Sons and daughters, granddaughters, grandsons, mother and fathers who we love will give their life for them. If they don't know Jesus, they are going to hell. And I cannot make that any clearer. Right now there's people in your life that you brush your shoulders with every day. Family, workplace, schools. And you know they're going to hell because you know they don't believe in Jesus. My question is, what are you doing about it? Are you doing anything about it? You know, Luke 16 talks about hell. It talks about two men, a rich man and a poor man. A rich man, not saying that rich people go to hell, but the rich man represents an unrighteous man and the poor man represents a righteous man. His name is Lazarus. It says in the story in Luke 16, the rich man died and it says this, he opened his eyes in hell. That was it. Think about that. There's not even a waiting place. If you don't believe in Jesus, when you open your eyes, you're going to be in the fire. And he looks over and he sees the poor man, Lazarus, and he says to Abraham, Abraham, just send that guy over here with a bit of water because I'm in agony with all this fire around me. Abraham says, no, I can't do that. And then he says to Abraham, okay, Abraham, do me a favor. Can you send Lazarus, this poor man, up above to my brothers? I've got four brothers. Please warn them not to come to this place where I am burning 
in agony and pain. And again, Abraham says, no, that's not going to happen either. And we read that story thinking it's just like a fairy tale, but it's not. These are the words of Jesus, and Jesus doesn't speak fairy tales. It's a real story about someone in their afterlife. Moments after death, this man opens up his eyes and he's in hell. Notice he's conscious. He's fully aware of his surroundings. He can feel the pain. He can see. He can recognize. He can remember things that happened up on earth. He's very, very conscious and aware of what's going on around him. And that's how it's going to be in hell. As you are now, you're going to be on fire forever. That's what hell is. And it's very, very sad to think that Christians know people that are again there, not doing anything about it. Let me ask you a question. If you're on the road and there's a bridge here and the bridge is out of action, there's no bridge. So if a car goes over, it will fall over and people will die. And you know that bridge is out of order. And all of a sudden, here comes a bus full of children, 50 children. Young boys and girls all laugh and having a lot of fun. And you know that if they go over that bridge, they will die. Will you try to stop them? I'm sure you would. You'll do something. Even if you have to jump in front of the car and say, whoa, whoa, stop, the bridge is out. We will do that. But yet every day we let hundreds of people fall into hell and we do nothing about it. And that's more important because that's forever, for eternity. Christians need to start waking up and understanding that our job is more important than just come to church on one hour a week. We have to start reaching out to people. I've seen these pictures of the two roads, and it's always like this on, on the paintings, that there will be this broad road leading to destruction, and they've got prostitutes and people killing each other. And then on the other side of the painting, they've got this small little winding road leading up to a mountain. And that, that's kind of the pictures that you'll probably see on the internet if you type in the two roads. But I read a, a commentary from another pastor, and he described it like this. He said, there's a broad road, and the Jesus road, the road that we're on, the, the narrow road, is slap bang right in the middle of this, and we go in the opposite direction. And I like that more. So think about it. Yeah, you are on the narrow road, walking this way towards your heavenly kingdom. Yeah, are hundreds, thousands of people going the other direction. Where are they headed? Hell. And we're walking past them. It's almost like we've got blinkers on. We don't want to see them. Why won't we shout it out and say, whoa, stop, stop. Don't go any further. Please come onto this one. Please come onto this Jesus road. But it looks like Christians are just walking, oblivious, saying, oh, bye-bye, bye-bye, bye-bye. Yet we know that they are going to hell. When are we going to start waking up and understanding that our role, our responsibility on this earth is to reach out to people? You got the salvation. You got the grace. You got the love. You got the joy. It's time to start sharing it. Let me close with two scenarios for you. Two scenarios. One scenario is this. You die and you come to the end of your life and you go to heaven. God bless you. You go to heaven, Jesus puts you on the chair and he starts showing you a form, a slideshow. And on this show is faces. Faces of all these people. Like, oh, young people, old people, black and white, rich and poor. All these people is just fun. And you're watching, you're not really understanding what this is about, but you're enjoying the show anyway. So you're watching all the faces go by. Hundreds, hundreds of uh, faces go by. Then afterwards, Jesus stops and he looks at you and says, these are the faces of the people that you had an opportunity to talk about me and you didn't. And because of that, they are not in heaven today because of you. Isn't that like a sad thought? There's another scenario. You die, you come to the end of your life, you sit on the chair, and Jesus calls out all these people from heaven. And they come standing around you. Hundreds, thousands of people start standing around you, and you're a bit confused. You don't know what's going on. You see some faces that look familiar, but you don't know where you've seen them before. And they all stand around you, and they crowd you. And then Jesus says, you see these people? They are in heaven today because of you. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Let me ask you a question. Are these two scenarios, which do you prefer? We all know the answer. And now that you've made that decision, Go out and tell people about the Jesus road. Don't let another day go past where you know that there's somebody who's going to hell and you are not doing anything about it. You've got to reach out to people and tell them there are two roads and there's two destinies. One leads to hell and one leads to everlasting life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.